We're also very much swayed by sentimentality. Wow, that's a great letter Y there. We can easily succumb to, well, our emotions. I mean, what, what strikes our emotions first and guides us past our, our logical selves. And there's the whole dichotomy between the emotional and logical brain. And of course, there's merits for both ways of, of guiding your life. Ideally, we, we would want our emotions, our emotions to guide us first and then check them with our logical brain. And this goes down to the neuro, neurological and neurobiological disposition as well. As we've seen with patients that have lesions in the amygdala, some of them are no longer able to make decisions at all. So this is clear evidence that our, our emotions are indeed what helps us decide and, and leads us to d decide on things. So if we don't do that, we end up succumbing to war or just having sex instead of making love, that whole thing with like the having mode versus the being mode. I'm having experiences versus being there now with other people. I'm succumbing to an ideology about my culture and going to war to defend the great nation or the great ideology versus trying to understand other people's perspectives, understand and respect other cultures. We, I mean, again, we have to be taught these ways of thinking. People don't just suddenly realize, wow, I really shouldn't be killing people in the name of this old guy who has no idea what's even going on. Like, what's the term? The young men go and kill each other in battle for the ideologies of old men who have never even met each other. Like that, it, this is terrible. And so this is a clear example of how we're sentimentally swayed. Our populations are easily manipulated in, th in this way. And, and so this brings me to the categorical imperative or being bounded by category. So, we, the brain does this compartmentalization issue where its primary function is to place people into camps and do this whole confirmation bias and, and try to condense and compartmentalize reality. And this gets into the nominology or the, the nominological wor world, like the, the world of the nameable. So we place labels on everything. We place labels on people and on things and and objects like the objective world. As Wittgenstein put it, we are bewitched by language. We are very much swayed by the language that we occupy without questioning it. And I've been making this point throughout this presentation, the idea that we, we don't question the language that we're, that we're taught. And so we succumb to diagnostic defaults. We default to what is most comfortable and the, the language that that exemplifies the ego and boosts our our own ego and boosts our conception of ourselves without question. In cases of war and politics, we use terms like utilitarianism or communism, like any example of, like anytime somebody will go to talk about considering contributing to the collective or giving a little bit more and maybe just slightly increasing taxes, that's immediately communism. That's immediately socialism because that word exists out in the ether and that gets absorbed by category. So that's, that's been under the category that instead of thinking on a broader spectrum, this is why we encourage emotional vocabulary. So this is the categorical imperative. We have an imperative to be beholden to categories of language. And when people don't have a, a larger vocabulary to describe all of their emotions or describe all of their feelings and how they think and how they believe, they will often condense and they'll, they'll go straight to, well, that's Christianity, that's Buddhism, that's socialism, that's capitalism, and so on and so forth. And this is why we don't have, it's so hard to reach a middle ground. This isn't just simply resolved by having better vocabulary either. I don't mean to insinuate that. Sometimes it can be worsened, as we've talked about here in this presentation. We have the diagnostic defaults that we can succumb to because we have 960 plus terms to choose from that all sound very specific and well examined and that can also produce this categorical biasing where there's this overarching category of psychology as it were that provides these these various vocabularies to work with and so that creates what peterson calls a linguistic territory i really don't like that term but it creates a a very detailed and well explicated way of thinking about the human condition and then there's this other whole ideology of bootstrap pulling and anti-fragility that also has various words that are perhaps not as well examined but that, that also provides a narrative for 
the conservative right or for the the people that just think that all brains work the same and commit the false equivalence fallacy. So that this is there are different ways that the categorical imperative can really pervade us. This is why we why I encourage just always questioning language in general. And whenever you go to use a term that sounds quite specific, try to catch yourself on that as well. So this brings me to the more individual problems here. The time contention. So we talked about this a bit before. Being able to extend our lifespan could make us lazy and not take on projects that we might take on otherwise. And so each generation deals with an increasingly better version of this. Our longevity is increasing and our health span is increasing. And that's good. And then we, we come to expect that, uh, this is a point I wanted to make earlier, we come to expect that we will live to 80 or 100 years when we could die tomorrow. And we, we could not be able to take on the projects and the meaningful goals that we could be. And not being grateful for the moment, not being able to live in the moment and be here now, as it were. And we also must contend with the problem of exponential change. So I also have a graph for this that we can look at. The so each generation deals with an increasingly worse version of this. So the evolution of technology and the changing of our language, that is accelerating and tangled up alongside each other in their exponential curve. So we are kind of on a evolutionary progress of our cognition going at basically like this level, and our exponential change is like this. And it's, it's almost flatlined, like our, our evolution has basically been the same for the past 100,000 years or so. I mean, some people argue that we are evolving into a more wise species. I don't, I don't really see a lot of evidence for that. I see our social structures improving and helping us teach people to be more wise. And that's helping, but our baseline cognition is still... We still have to deal with all of this because those are perennial problems that are the result of our, our evolutionary neurology not improving and our cognitive capacity is not really evolving up. And so, of course, this is creating AI now, and this is making it such that we could be just wiping ourselves out with AI. I mean, the, the things are, it's like the rug is being pulled out from under us, and we wove that, that rug ourselves without realizing it. I call this the self-pulling rug. And this is a huge problem, and we're already seeing people turn to artificial intelligence replica bots as a therapist, like Pi and like Replica, to supplant relationships and supplant the relationship that you would have with a therapist because of the convenience of having a therapist in your pocket at all times. And that that's a, certainly a benefit, but it also could be very much detrimental because it's encouraging people to rely too much on technology for real down-to-earth serious human conditions and resolving of those conditions. And we'll talk about this more in, in future videos as well. So just another fun phrase here, check your privilege. This is a term that's come up in the political left quite prominently, I would say around 2019 or so. We do end up growing up in, in areas that, well, they are not war-torn, and when you're not in an area that doesn't consistently contend with real-world struggles, you can end up imposing your belief systems on other cultures that do contend with those struggles, as we see in the book Crazy Like Us and in other cultural anthropology literature. In the American culture especially, we we live like kings. The average person that's in the working class, you would say, they're living as kings did 400 years ago. The average pantry is like a king's pantry. We have access to spices that used to cost a fortune a few hundred years ago. And now we we eat like kings and we live like kings and, and yet we complain constantly because we don't have this long-spanning perspective. We don't really know how to be grateful. We aren't taught like long-term gratitude exercises. This is why I, I try to recommend what I call retrospective gratitude. And the process of forming this retrospective gratitude, it, it has to be an exercise. Like we have to dedicate effort to that kind of gratitude and becoming consistently mindful of that because it doesn't come naturally to us, at least not in the US. Of course, in more impoverished areas where struggle is more of a regular thing and, and uh, adversity is something that people don't instantly become adverse to. That connection and that gratitude for the simplest of things is, it's kind of forced upon people, and to put it harshly. If we don't address that, I mean, like nobody has a plan for this. We're running a giant social experiment in the United States and we don't know the future of this, but we're certainly seeing the results already. We are quite privileged beyond what we recognize on in all parts of the political spectrum. Of course, this happens in 
in the working class, but it happens in the upper class or whatever, middle class, whatever you want to call that. And you see this exemplified in, in the suburb lifestyle and the uh, social exclusion. And this gets back to the whole isolation crisis without realizing it, like we're, we're isolating ourselves from the rest of our neighborhood. I'm sure you've heard people talk about how just a few decades ago, people used to know their neighbors and now people don't know their neighbors anymore. We're concerned with the absorbed in our identity and it's individualism that we're exemplifying in the West and now we take on projects that have nothing to do with anyone else. We take on little home improvement projects. This is why the channel HGTV is flourishing right now. We have thousands of ways to improve your home but not improve yourself and so people are obsessing over this whole how can I fix up my walls? How can I decorate my, my lawn? How can I better build a better fence around my property to keep people off my property? And it just gets way out of control. And I saw I saw this when I used to work at Home Depot and home improvement stores. I mean, those those stores are flourishing right now. Every year they're increasing in revenue by millions of dollars. It's because people are, or largely because people are indeed indulging in this idea of improving their environment, but not themselves, or improving their their property instead of improving themselves. And that's really unfortunate. But I believe this is directly tied to the isolationist, individualist culture that has been bred from the obsession of the ego, the obsession of the individual self and its extension to the close family, but not to the community and not not even beginning to consider once that we are one, that we are in a distributed cognition. That whole concept is very much foreign to us. Fortunately, 4E cognitive science is beginning to kind of bring this back to the surface, but that's really in higher academia that we see that it's not really being applied level as it has been for, for thousands of years in the East. And again, it's not that one way or the other is the right way of thinking. The individual has a place in its community. The community has a place in the individual. But when you isolate one of those, or when you go too far into one of these ways of thinking, you run into problems, especially if you aren't taught to begin with how, how much this can pervade your reality and how much you can obsess over that, how you can feel a sense of security and, and confidence and status that can carry, th carry through life to an extent but can ultimately leave you very unfulfilled and can give rise to disorders or disordered states. Anyways, let's get to the final little category here, the seven deadly sins. So, of course, this has got to make the list. It's a perennial problem for a reason, mentioned in the Bible, because these are major categories that have consistently plagued people. So, greed. We, I mean, starting with greed, going back to this whole isolationism and like prioritization of the individual here we are extremely greedy and we're extremely selfish we and we're also very culture bound in this way we think america first as was encouraged by trump and, and many other political leaders uh, put forth donations towards our country first instead of donating to other countries i've very much seen this exemplified and just keeping keeping resources to ourselves or just like greedily in, in the having mode again, going back to that concept of being consistently in the state of acquisitional material gain, like trying to acquire and acquire and get the next best thing, get the next best video game when we could be going out and, and dedicating time towards others or going to spend time with others and having fun with other people. I could go on with that for a long time, but let's go to the next one. Envy. So here we have jealousy and the the problems of comparison, like we also have a very big comparison bias, you could call it, where, well, the term goes, comparison is the thief of joy. And that term has been around for a very long time. The problems of, of wanting the next best thing or, or wanting what celebrities have, I mean, this this is one that's that's been exposed a lot more and has been talked about more in, in the public eye, I believe. But it also very much has a place in therapy, I believe. The the need to communicate directly to our patients that going for what celebrities are doing or paying too much attention to what other people are acquiring is not going to get you anywhere. That's just going to leave you unfulfilled and consistently unfulfilled. So next category, lust. Sexual attraction. The need to be sexually satisfied and also just be a lord. So there's different ways to think of, of lust. Like we could also be uh, bewitched by highly satiating experiences. And so we could become addicted to other experiences in that way too. But mostly this concerns physical attraction and it's extremely uncomfortable to talk about with a patient. You're, 
you're gonna have a hard time asking a patient, how's your sex life? How's your addiction to pornography and, and things like that? I mean, because patients, you can ask those questions, but patients are gonna have a hard time responding to that. They're not gonna feel comfortable about it. And so we're now incredibly overstimulated in this regard as well. We, we're also very much encouraging this in the capitalist West as well. So with unregulated capitalism specifically, we have people throwing their lives away essentially for highly lucrative pornographic pursuits. Um, I think the statistics are for a YouTube video that takes someone a week to put together, they'll at best get 500 to 500,000 to a million views after putting in like years of growing their channel. Whereas you could upload one porn video and within a day you would get 5 million views. And so like the, the money aspect there, like the motivation for people to just to give up and say, screw this, I'm not going to do genuine work and put forth the value into the community and instill value in myself by honing my craft. They're honing the temporary body and the, and the superficial self that's going to completely destroy them later on. Like, you can only do porn for so long until your body gives out. There's a quote from Marcus Aurelius, I believe he said, I was daily licking the open wound of lust. <laughs> Like, oh my God, just, uh, this has clearly been a huge problem for people for many years. And I feel, uh, I feel pity for, uh, for the way that this is going. And I worry for the direction of this, but how do you regulate it again? I mean, how would, how would we go about that? So yeah, I mean, the main concern here is just trying to gently encourage the patients not to succumb to these things, not, not to, or just check themselves. But when we supplant our relationships for digital sexual satisfaction that becomes hugely problematic and i have friends that are highly intelligent that tell me straight up that they're they're doing the thing well it's not just porn there's like there's levels of this where you can pay a certain amount of money and get a person to say your name and have like a some kind of split digital interaction relationship with this person as we saw kind of like in the movie her where now that that was split between thousands of people and the AI learned your name, we're also succumbing to that too. And this is exemplified in Replica, the phone app, I believe that the, the relationships that can form there can easily supplant what could be interpreted as a meaningful actual relationship. And we don't have any therapies for that, y'all. Like we, we haven't developed anything to deal with this world that we're creating for ourselves. Which brings me to the next category, sloth, the <laughs> laziness and lackadaisical laxity. So that's a huge problem in the US as well. As we were talking about before, the whole aver aversion to adversity. We're encouraging this awful lifestyle. And we're, we don't even encourage people to get out and exercise. We're just going to sell you an exercise machine so you can just walk in place or run on a treadmill and not not be in the mode of, of viewing. There's also neuroscience behind this too. When you're, in a, when you're moving forward in a safe and controlled fashion, this ups dopamine and, and instills long-lasting positivity, long-lasting dopamine as well. The practice of, uh, well, skating for one thing, like this did this, this very well for me. When you have objects moving past you and you're in control while you're doing that, it's extremely joyful. It's, it's a wonderful exercise and it also keeps you physically in shape. We're essentially in this culture, we're very much encouraging people to remain slothful, remain in this place of taking the least resistant path, even for things that people know they need to be doing, like exercising and socializing. We're socializing on the internet, social media. We're exercising in a small controlled condensed environment. We're engaging in joy and engaging in entertainment in ways that are controlled. And we're engaging in gaming in these little digital devices, as opposed to going out and playing games with other people, playing sports or, or board games. And, that's uh, it's very unfortunate this is where things are going and so d having this conversation with your patient is also quite crucial i believe and a more uncomfortable conversation to have with your patient is one about gluttony so how do we tell people that they're overweight that's really really tricky and it's uh, now we are in very much a culture that can be offended easily i guess is the gentle way to put it it's not the psychologist's job to tell people that they're overweight the, there's some part of the conversation that needs to be had about that because people will succumb to the problem of envy when they're comparing themselves to others that don't have the weight problems that they do. So part of the therapy process, this is where a physical health coach or exercise coach would come into play and a nutritionist would come into play and that they all have to be in contact with each other 
in an interdisciplinary fashion in this way. Like the the health coach needs to be checking the person's diet. They need to be making sure that they have financial access to these diets. And this is where things like food stamps could do a better job, I believe. Really encouraging people to get on food stamps when they when they need to and when they qualify for them, because you can have access to healthier food that way. In the United States, if you're located in one of the states that allows for uh, you to be working a certain amount of hours and also apply for food stamps, that could be a solution this way, um, at least temporarily so. So the the problem of, of gluttony is, is really tricky and I don't have a solution for it, honestly, like when it comes to psychology at least, other than this team effort approach. And so we also have the problem of pride. Pride comes before the fall. The overconfidence problem that we have going on here, there, there are many terms surrounding psychology that talk about how people can become narcissistic and narcissism and not realize it. Like people can be defending their egos unconsciously from, from a place where they're, they, don't, they don't realize they're doing so. And this is really problematic. Other people talk about this like vain glory or just being in a self-aggrandizing narcissistic perspective without realizing it. So your job as a, as a therapist here is to break down those ego walls, is to break down a person's currently held conception of themselves without causing an existential crisis and without causing them to, to not want to talk to you anymore and to not seek therapy ever again. That's, that's the real risk that we face as therapists is really putting these in the right words and being mindful in the moment of the people that we're working with and how our words are affecting them. And so we also have the concept of wrath, and this is what I call the vengeance mindset or the, the revenge mindset. This is talked about in uh, heavy detail in the book Determined by Robert Sapolsky that came out recently, and other books that get into the idea of questioning free will and comparison of uh, egos as well. The concept of ideology and the concept of good and evil, again pulling from Socrates, there's no such thing as good and evil, only wisdom versus ignorance. And there's also Hanlon's razor, which says, never attribute malice to that which could be adequately attributed to stupidity slash ignorance. So most people are ignorant. Most people don't know what they're doing. Again, our, our free will is very, very limited. When you ask psychologists, many of them give stats like 95% of the time people are on running around on autopilot, and that's very much true. People don't question how competitive they are. They don't question how how vengeful they can be. They want justice, they want absolution, they want things to be worked out and life to be fair. And well, life is not fair. To a large degree, we have to encourage our patients to accept that as well. This is really problematic. I've had friends as well that have been stuck in the vengeance mindset for years. It's very Machiavellian, it's very puritanical and, and an old way of thinking. Because what psychology really shows us, if you take psychology seriously, is that people do indeed struggle very much with free will and making decisions. Most of their decisions are made for them. And so much of that is, is succumbing to ideology or to all these other deadly sins, especially lust and, and greed. And people can exemplify these, these traits, if you want to call them that, without realizing it and people can commit horrible acts without realizing it. We want to be able to forgive them. We want to be able to be patient with them and understanding and their struggle in that way. But the other emotional side of us is thinking, well, I really want to see them punished and get what's coming to them for that. And so we have the criminal justice system just completely up in arms with this, not knowing how to proceed. And we have to go to extreme examples like the, uh, the person who grew a t tumor in their brain and they started uh, committing horrible violent acts, another person grew a tumor and they committed horrible sexual acts, and then the tumor was removed and people, well, they, they recovered and they stopped doing that. And the tumor came back and they started doing it. So it's like that, but it's tumors all the way down, <laughs> like turtles all the way down, that kind of idea. We don't want to give people that kind of grace though. We want to think that people are always in control of what they're doing. And so we, we judge them and we put them in jail based on that assumption. But of course, the large majority of the time, people are not in control and we have to teach them that control. We have to be patient and we have to teach them these therapies and strategies for wielding their brain and not being wielded by it, not being cast about by the whims of their own neurochemistry. And that's hard to accept in, in the West as well because we have this kind of superficial judgment system where we 
We judge people based on their actions and not their intentions. Again, coming back to the whole idea of keeping one eye open for how to view people in the best light, and another eye open for not being taken advantage of. Not necessarily justice, or not necessarily getting what people deserve and what's coming to them, but just not, like trying to set up systems where people don't commit these acts in the first place, and how we can best not be affected by their negative acts. So anyways, that's the whole video. I really hope this presentation hasn't been too overwhelming, and I hope I've been able to convey these ideas in a calm and mature fashion. If you have any feedback, please let me know, and uh, well, thanks for watching, y'all. So if you have any questions, please let me know, and uh, thanks so much for watching.